it is illuminating to think about the connection you made between physics and computation. You basically have created the, or helped create the quantum theory of computation. And there are a lot of researchers and technologists now working on quantum computers, tons of them. In fact, we just talked to Maria. She's off to work at some quantum computing company. Nice. And not all of these people believe in the quantum theory of the multiverse. Did you start with Hugh Everett's many worlds theory or, and then get to quantum computation? Yeah. Or was that, yeah. and, and do you view that as fundamental? Like, how, can you explain quantum computation with the observer collapse theory? Or is that yes. just so, contradictory? Uh, as you may know, when I first came up with the idea of quantum, compu quantum computer, I didn't even think of it as a quantum computer. I didn't call it that. What I was trying to do is, so the consensus at the time among people who work on Everett's multiverse theory was that the multiverse theory gives the same experimental predictions as collapse theory. And in a way that was already known to be false. There's the paradox of Vigna's friend. And, but you know how People just take paradoxes. Yeah, that's a paradox. They don't think that's a reason why we're wrong. It's fundamentally wrong in our worldview. So I thought, I thought that Everett's theory must be testable. And it was testable because it, it proposed the different dynamics from the wave function collapse, all the wave function collapse theories. So I thought, okay, how would we test it? And I thought, simplest thing, you do a version of the two slit experiment, then you have to have a measurement of that measurement and how do you do that? And I thought, oh, it could be done with a computer. So there's this computer that, but if the computer is going to have um, quantum, the, the two slit experiment or whatever you call it, the stone gallic experiment or whatever, they're all equivalent really. If it's going to have that in it, then the computer can't be decoherent. It, so it can't be a classical computer. So it must be augmented with these quantum operations. Which operations would you need? So I added some operations to make a coherent classical computer with these extra operations. And that's what it was in my mind. It was just an object. It was an object connected to a computer with certain... That what I was interested in is something else. It was this experiment that you could do. So then I wrote a paper about that experiment, which among other things, there was only one section of the paper that had that in it. And then that paper was rejected and the story that the, the, they said that's philosophy. And I was like, okay, yeah, I don't care. So I put it aside and I didn't, I didn't get it out again. I told, would tell people about it. Like when I was talking to other physicists, I, I told Roger Penrose and I said, okay, now you've got to, you, you've got to accept that if quantum theory is true, universally true, then Everett is right. And he said, yeah, but quantum theory isn't true. Okay, that's a consistent position, but that's not the position that the vast majority of uh, physicists took. So then at the same conference where I asked Roger Penrose that, I was also talking to someone who worked for a publisher and he said, why don't you submit it? And I was like, oh, that's too much trouble. And eventually I submitted it and it was eventually published at the same time as my universal quantum computers paper, even though it came much earlier. And people think that I thought of them in the opposite order, but I didn't. I first thought of the experiment to test Everett, and then much later thought about quantum computers. Is this the same experiment that's mentioned in the beginning of infinity as going inside the mind of the AI? Yes. I see. So you came up with that first. Yes. To, so you had to create experiment to test many worlds and it said, okay, is the observer making a difference? Yes. Let's get inside the observer. Yes. But if we get inside the observer, it's just a double slit experiment all over again, yes. unless there's a quant different kind of computer than yeah. the classical computer. It's not going to be affected by the same interference effects that the double slit experiment is vulnerable to. So we need to create qubits or quantum computing uh, or what? what yeah, like, again, yeah. the term qubit wasn't invented until much, sure, much okay. later. And, and I did, as I said, I didn't think of it like that. Yeah, so you were solving a different problem. Yeah, <laughs> a different problem. Related. And it, it didn't cross my mind that this was a new mode of computation. Mm. And to do this test, we'll need AGI as well. Yeah, that's not my fault. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's the opposition that wants the, the, the conscious observer to be, to do something different. 
okay. And you know, that, in that case, you put a conscious observer. In. It needs it needs AGI and it needs quantum computing. It needs both. Yes. The AGI has to be a quantum computer internally. It has to be running on the quantum computer. I see. Because the alternative perspective is otherwise you have interference. We well, yeah, it's the opposition that is saying that it is the observer collapsing the wave function and. And so, well, if that's their position, then we have to have an observer that can observe things without collapsing wave functions. Yeah, yeah. but the, this observer doesn't do much that's quantum. He only, he only does a few quantum operations, like half a dozen quantum operations. But most of the time, he's thinking about things like, do I know this and, and, and so yeah. on. And that's all done with classical operations, but done with coherent quantum objects. So they have to be done with qubits instead of bits.